In exercise one, we're gonna be focusing on building this quiz game. So this exercise is broken into two parts, um, but I'm just gonna give you a rundown of what the quiz game is going to be, and then we'll talk about what the two parts are. So the quiz game is basically just going to be a game where you come in and you, uh, let me actually see if I have the code for it. Yes, I do. All right, so I've already recorded the video for it, so now I'm just doing the intro to sort of show you what you're expected to do. Um, in this, we're gonna be building a, a little application that will read a CSV file and we'll start a quiz that has a timer. Now these quizzes are gonna be relatively simple. Um, they're gonna come from a CSV file and they're intended to be something like addition problems or multiplication problems. Little like math problems, things like that, that are gonna be one word or one term answers, you know, maybe one number. So if we run it, um, well, first off, let me run it with the help flag. So if you run it, uh, basically you've got a couple options. You can provide a CSV file, but there's a default for it, and you can provide a time limit. So when you run the quiz, it's going to read that CSV file, parse the question comma answer columns, turn it into a little quiz, and give you the questions one at a time. If the time limit runs out, it's then gonna stop the quiz and say, you know, you ran out of time, but here's your score. Uh, the first version you're gonna build is not going to have the time limit. So I'm gonna come over here to the exercise real quick and show you. The first version is just going to read the CSV file, and then it's going to go through every problem in it, asking the user to give an answer to it. And then once they've gone through every single problem, it'll give them a total score, like you scored seven out of 12, something like that. And there is a sample CSV file in the directory. You know, if you clone the repo, you'll be able to grab that. And then the second part is going to be where we add the timer, and you know, we lose, use a little bit of concurrency and things like that to keep track of basically whether or not the time has run out and we cancel the program immediately if the time runs out. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you that version now. So I'm gonna put the limit to two seconds. So it's gonna be very quick. And you can see here, I can answer the first question, but if I take too long to answer the second question, run out of time, uh, you know, it basically stops the quiz and says you scored one out of 12. So that's what we're looking for here. If you want a little more details, you know, I have more here on the repo, you can read there about it. And there's a couple bonus exercises if you wanna look into those. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the basic idea here is just to try to get something that's working and, you know, learn about it, uh, learn about basically the flags package, the CSV package. You're going to use the OS package to open up the file more than likely. You're going to use channels and go routines to do the timer part. And you'll probably use the time package with the timer part as well, because that's the easiest way to do it, in my opinion. Um, there might be a couple other packages, but that's roughly what you're going to be looking to get into. Our first exercise is going to involve reading in this problems.csv file. And we're just gonna take it and we're gonna create questions and answers for a quiz that we're gonna present to the end user. So we're gonna start by creating a main.go source file. And we're gonna make this package main, func main. And in this, we're basically just going to write our code that presents the quiz problems, accepts the user's input, and checks for correctness. That's roughly all we're trying to do in this first pass. So the first thing we're going to want to do is declare the or get the file name. And we're going to use the flag package for this. And we know this is going to be a string. We'll name the flag CSV. We'll say the default value is going to be problems.csv. That seems like a reasonable CSV file name. And for help text, we're going to say something like a CSV file in the format of a problem. We'll say question, comma, answer. Uh, yeah, I think that's fine. It should be you know, clear enough as to what we're doing. We just want a CSV with the question common answer format. So once we have our flag defined, the next thing we need to do, or all of our flags defined that is, we need to tell the flag package to parse all of them. So we're gonna call flag.parse. So by doing this, I'm going to just assign CSV file name to underscore just so our code compiles. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna run this, we're gonna build this application, and then we're gonna go ahead and see what this flag package is giving us. So if we build and then we run this quiz program, you'll see that nothing really happens when we run it, but if we add the dash H, I could type today, uh, or if you add dash dash help, they're both the same, it will give us some usage of how the program works. And in this case, you're seeing that, you know, CSV is a string flag, and it gives you a little bit of helper text that says a CSV file in the format of question comma answer, and it gives you the default value. So the flag package is providing all of this for us and just making it easier to get values from the user when they run a binary. Now this is really handy for code where you expect just to give people a binary and let them work with it, 
because a lot of the times they won't be able to read the source code to see, you know, what were you intending with these flags or what are the flags available. But with this, all you have to do is give them the binary and they have the tools to check. So next we want to read this file. Um, so we can get rid of this underscore part. And we're gonna say file comma error colon equals os dot open. And we need to pass in the CSV file name, but we need to use an asterisk here because CSV file name is going to be a pointer to a string. That's just how the flag package works. And in this case, we want to make sure that, you know, we're using the actual value from that string, not the pointer. So we can say, if the error is not equal to nil, uh, we wanna print out some sort of message that says we couldn't open this file. So I'm gonna go ahead and do uh, printf, and I'm gonna say failed to open the CSV file, and we'll put a string here. And then let's go ahead and pass in the CSV file name. The reason I wanna pass in the CSV file name, and I'm gonna put os.exit with a status code of one, which basically means that something went wrong. And again, um, I'm just gonna put the underscore here so our code compiles temporarily. So exit code of one is basically just saying our application had an error of some sort. And for this failed to open the CSV file, I'm printing out the full file name because I want the user to actually see what we tried to open rather than what they think we tried to open, this way they'll actually get to see it. So if we run our code, um, I need to go build. And if we do dash CSV equals uh, abc.csv. So you'll see here that it says failed to open the file abc.csv. Now this percent at the end is because I don't have a new line character. So I can just add that real quick. And whenever I run this again, there's no, you know, no percent at the end but it's showing us that it failed to open the file and it's printing it out fully. Well, the reason I like this is let's say they have a space in their file and they don't realize it. Maybe it's ab space cd.csv. If you run this, you'll see that our code is only trying to open a file named ab. So that could be something that really confuses an end user when they don't realize, oh, I need to put that in quotes or something like that. So in this case, they would clearly see that it's not getting the full file name. Maybe they'd put it in quotes like this and they'd see that, oh, now it's working or you know, it's trying the, at least the correct file name. Another thing we could do here is this exiting part where we print a message and then exit. It could be something where we want to make an exit function. You know, maybe we only exit if there's an error. So we're going to go ahead and just say uh, print line. This is going to be the message. And then we OS exit with one. So up here, we can just change this to be sprintf and call exit with that message. So the same basic idea, we're just breaking this into a function that we can reuse. So once we have our file open, we're gonna to wanna to create a CSV reader. So to do this, we're gonna use the CSV package and there's a new reader function that takes in an io.reader. Well, the file that we open up up here is an io.reader, so we can just pass that right in. And I will say that as we write some Go code, you're gonna see this io.reader interface used a lot. If I go to the source code, I can go io reader golang. So readers, are, the io.reader is probably the most, the reader and the writer at least, are the uh, most common interfaces you're gonna see used in Go. And that's because they're very simple. They just have the simple read method. And you know it, it takes in a byte slice that it's gonna read into, and it returns n the number of bytes that it read or an error. And this is really nice because whenever you're writing code that you know, maybe you're expecting to read from a file, you can just use the reader interface. And now, as long as a file implements that, you could actually have code that not only works with files, but maybe it works with, you know, you can create string readers or buff, you know, or byte slice readers or things like that. And now your code that originally only worked with a single file can work with all these different types. And, you know, it just really makes it much, much easier to write code that way. For example, um, the response writer in the net HTTP package is it implements the writer interface. And because of that, you can just fumpt.fprintline to write things directly out to the term, you know, to the web request if you wanted. So once we've created the CSV reader, the next thing we wanna do is get some lines from it. Uh, we want it to parse the CSV. So there's a couple different ways to do this. In our case, we're just gonna parse the entire file up front. And the reasoning for that, you know, into, into a, a 2D slice that is. And the reasoning for that is, any quiz we're gonna give an end user is not going to be so big that it's gonna blow up memory. It's just very unlikely that somebody's gonna have a quiz with billions of lines that's gonna you know, make a, or cause memory issues. So we really don't need to worry about that. 
what we're going to do here is we're just going to say lines comma error colon equals r dot read all. And this will read all of the lines inside of the CSV. Our next step is to see if there's an error. So if the error is not nil, um, in this case, we don't, again, we don't care too much about what the specific error is. We're just going to go ahead and tell the user that for some reason we couldn't parse the CSV file. Now, maybe it makes sense to log something, you know, that's hidden from the user, or maybe to log, you know, if it was a web application or something like that. But since it's just a terminal application, we're just going to print out a generic message of exit failed to parse the provided CSV file. So it's not amazing, but it'll at least let them know that, you know, something's wrong with your CSV file. Otherwise, we want to do something with the lines. And for now, what we're going to do is we're just going to print them out. So if we run this, you'll see that if we have an invalid CSV file, it's going to go ahead and complain. But we know that problems.csv exists. And when we print this out, you'll see that we do get a 2D slice back. And you know the outer slice just has slices inside of it. And each slice inside of it has a question and then an answer. Next, we're going to take those lines and we're going to build a problem. So I'm going to go ahead and define this problem type. And you don't necessarily have to do it. We could just use the slice and print everything out that way. I just like to break this into a type. You know, I'll just show you what it is. Type problem struct. And this is going to have a question, which is a string. And it's going to have an answer, which is a string. So the reason I like to break this up is basically because whenever you're writing the rest of your code, if you were to change it down the road, say maybe you don't read from a CSV file, maybe you read from a JSON file, maybe you read from something else entirely. Uh, this makes it much, much easier to make the rest of your code not really change. Because if we're using a 2D slice and we're expecting that to be the format for the rest of our code, everything we do, we have to turn into that 2D slice. But if we create a struct like this, we can just expect the rest of our code to always expect a bunch of problems in this format. And we don't have to worry too much about how they originally came into our program. So knowing that, we're going to want some way to create problems via a CSV you know, 2D slice. So we'll say func parse lines. And this takes in lines, which is a 2D string slice. And it's going to return a slice of problems. Now. You know, maybe if you have a bunch more parsing functions, it makes more sense to name this differently. But for now, I think this is fine. We don't have a whole lot going on in this code. And I know that at the end of this program, it's not going to be more than maybe 60 lines of code. So it should still be pretty easy to, to navigate through and everything like that. So what we're going to do here is we're going to first declare the variable we're going to return. So we want to return a slice of problems. And it's going to have a length the same as the length of the total number of lines. And that's because the outer slice in this you know, line slice is going to be the number of rows in our CSV file. So we're just going to assume that every row in the CSV file is a problem. So then at the very end, we're going to return this problem slice that we created. But first, we need to go ahead and fill in every single value inside of the slice with one of the lines. So we're going to say for i comma line in the range of lines. And we're going to say ret at i is equal to problem. So we're creating a new problem here. We're going to say the question is going to be line 0, and the answer is going to be line at index 1. So we're doing this before, because the first column is the question, and the second column is the answer. Now, you might be wondering why we don't just, you know, maybe we create this with a value or a length of 0, and then we use append inside of here to add to it, which would be completely fine. The biggest reason why I'm not doing that is, in my opinion, when you know exactly what length you want something to be, there's no real reason to let the append function, you know, do that extra work of resizing the slice whenever it needs to and stuff like that. We know exactly how big it needs to be, so why not just go ahead and use that information? All right, so at this point, parse line should be working. We are going to change this print line statement to instead parse the lines. So we're going to say problems colon equals parse lines lines. And at this point, we could just print out the problems to see you know, what that looks like. So looking at our terminal, you can see that this is basically the same thing, except instead of having a 2D slice, we have a slice. And inside of it, these curly braces mean that it's a struct of some sort. And these are the values inside of that struct. So next up is iterating over all these problems and printing them out to the end user. So we want to print them out, get a response from the user, and then check to see if the user is correct. 
So we're going to start with a for loop, and we're going to say for i, comma p in the range of problems. So p is going to be the problem, each individual one in the slice, and i is going to be the index we're on. And with this, we're going to print out, uh, we're going to use printf, and we're going to print out problem number percent %d. And percent %d is going to basically just be a number value that we're going to replace in this printf. And then we're going to print out the actual problem here, and we're going to put an equal sign at the end. Now, I'm going to add a new line character at the end as well, but we'll eventually get rid of that. And then here, I'm going to say i plus 1, because our index is 0 based. But usually, when you're giving a quiz, it doesn't start at problem 0. It starts at problem 1. So we might just want to go ahead and add 1 to every single one to make it a little bit simpler. And then after that, we're going to go ahead and put, uh, we don't want line 0. We want p dot question. So it prints out the question. And by question, I just mean q, because this is what we named these variables here. Or fields, rather. But yeah. Um, so at this point, we should be printing out every single problem. And we can go back to our code, or our, you know, our terminal, and run our code. And you'll see here that now when we run it, it actually prints out every single problem with the equal sign at the end. So our next step is to read in an answer. So we need first a variable to store it in. And then we're going to use the scanf function, which I will say right now that there are cases where this is not appropriate. In this case, it's a relatively simple program where every answer is going to be a single number, you know, because we're just doing math quizzes. So if you're accepting string answers and things like that that had multiple words, this will not work the way you're going to expect it to more than likely. So the scanf will actually get rid of all the spaces, so any trailing space, leading space, that sort of thing. And that's probably not what you want, you know, if the answer is like, the man walked. You know, it's going to be three words, and that's not, it's not going to be read that way. So we're also going to put a new line here at the end just to make sure that it captures that new line if the user presses enter when they type in their answer. And we're going to pass in a reference to answer, which is the string that we just created. And the reason we're doing this is we need to make sure that it has a pointer value to work with so that whenever it sets the value, we can access it with our variable. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and see if the answer is correct. So we're going to say if the answer is equal to p.answer, then we need to do something. So let's just print out correct for now. Otherwise, um, you know, we could print incorrect, but I'm just going to let it be blank. So going back to our code, we're going to run this. If we type in 10 here, you'll see it says correct. If I put space, space, two, space, space, you'll see that even in that case, it trims off all those spaces and it still gives us a correct answer. So if I type in something like 10, which is incorrect, we don't get anything back. So at this point, the next step is to keep track of how many problems we get correct. To do this, we're going to start a counter before we even start showing problems. That's just going to keep a score of, you know, you've got zero correct so far. Once we've done that, we're going to come down here to where we print out correct. And instead of printing correct, we're going to increment that counter every single time the user gets a question, you know, a question right. Now that we know exactly how many problems are correct, we can actually stop at the end of the quiz and we can tell, or not stop, we can print out at the end of the quiz how many problems they scored correctly. So we could do something like printf, um, you scored percent %d out of percent %d. And you know, that's, it's a simple message, but it's just at least giving them a total score. So the first number is how many they got correct. And the second number is how many problems there were. So we're going to use length of the problem slice to figure that out. So if we run this, um, I'm actually going to change this temporarily. I don't want to answer 12 questions, so I'm just going to go ahead and make it so it's only two. And we're going to have 10, 2. I scored a 2 out of 2. So we just want to make sure that incorrect answers are getting taken in, into account. So if we just get a 1 out of 2, you'll see that that's what we get here as well. So changing this back to the full quiz, um, I probably didn't want to do that just yet, but that's OK. Another thing that we might want to look at at this point is potential edge cases or you know error cases. And we're not going to write tests for it, but it is something that might make sense to consider you know, as you're building this program. So we're only at you know, 58 lines of code. Our code isn't too complicated or anything like that. But if you did want to write tests, it might make sense to start breaking some of this into functions that are easier to test. For example, this code here that prints out a problem and checks for a correct answer, maybe it makes sense at this point to break this up into some sort of function that you, know, you provide it with a problem and it does, and maybe a number for the problem and it does all the work. And then you can write a test for it to sort of check that. And maybe instead of using printf and scanf, you'd want to use 
um, you know, pass in standard, standard in and standard out is the input streams and output streams. But for now, I think this is fine as it is. The one uh, corner case that I do want to mention though, is if we go to our CSV, let me go ahead and just get rid of all this again. If the CSV comes in with somewhat invalid data, so for example, let's say there's some spaces here, it's not technically invalid, but the problem we have here is that scanf is going to trim all the spaces. So it's impossible for us to give an answer that matches this because the spaces are there. So knowing that we're only dealing with numbers and the spaces aren't really something we want to be there, one way to fix this is to use the strings package and to strings.trim space for the answer whenever you're building that part. So it's a relatively simple addition to add, but this will help us at least whenever the CSV comes in, making sure that all the questions that we're getting are actually answerable. So once we've done that, um, you know, you'll see that I have saved this file. The 10 does have many spaces. If I run this, if I type in space, space, 10, space, space, uh, you know, or space, space two here, we still get the two out of two. So our scanf is trimming the spaces and our answer is getting trimmed out of here. So you'll see if I get rid of this line or you get rid of this part and save it. Now, if I run the code, if I type in 10 here and two here, you'll see I only get a one out of two. That 10 problem is being incorrect because I don't have the spaces there. And even if I put space, space 10, I still only get a one out of two. So that's what we're doing here with this trim space. We're just, you know, trying to handle one of those corner cases where somebody might give us an invalid CSV. Now, maybe it instead makes more sense to write some sort of validator for the CSVs. You know, it's, it's really up to you. But I think for now, this is a, a good enough solution to the problem. That's it for the first part of this quiz game. Um, at this point, we've looked at five different packages and we've built a quiz game that works. It's not timed, but it does, you know, read the CSV file and present a quiz. So I wanted to go ahead and just take a break here so you could, one, just so you have a simpler program to start off with, just get the quiz part working. And then whenever we go to the second part, you can make sure you really understand everything that's going on here before we start adding in things like go routines, channels, um, and the time package in order to make this a timed quiz. In part two, we're going to work on adding a time limit to our quiz game. So going back to the description, uh, basically what we want here is whenever the user is going through this quiz, let's say they get to you know, whatever problem they're on, it doesn't really matter. Um, if the time limit expires, we want them to, you know, to be given a message that says, you know, we ran out of time, or maybe just print out a message that says, all right, the quiz is over, you scored you know, four out of 12 or something like that, whatever it ends up being. Um, so the idea here is just going to be creating a timer that hopefully, you know, something we don't have to continuously check all the time. Um, and, you know, that will just sort of run in the background and tell us, all right, you know, the quiz is done, you need to stop doing whatever you're doing. And I say that because ideally what we don't want is we don't want to like present the user with a problem like eight plus three. And if they type in, you know, say the time limit expires, and then they type in an answer afterwards and press enter. Well, one way to do this would be to have our quiz check and see, you know, did you give us an answer before time expired? Well, if they didn't, we're going to basically tell them like, oh, you gave us the answer 11, which might be right, but you know, your time expired before you hit enter. So we're not going to take it. And it's not that that doesn't work. It's just, it's kind of not the best experience for a user. They're going to be like, well, you know, why didn't you just tell me time was up before I sat there finishing that problem? Um, so that's what we're going to be doing with that. And on top of that, we don't want the opposite where, you know, if time does expire and they put in an answer afterwards and hit enter, we don't want to accept those answers. So we're going to look at how to use channels to send us a message whenever the time has expired, and then to use a select statement to verify, all right, time has expired, we need to go ahead and stop this quiz. So going to our code, uh, we're gonna start by just defining a time limit, and that's going to be a flag. And it's gonna be a flag.int. We're gonna call this limit. The default value is gonna be 30, and we're gonna say that this is the time limit for the quiz in seconds. So I'm just gonna do it in seconds because I don't see much use to go lower as far as uh, units go. And I know that for the quizzes, or at least we're gonna be doing in this video, I want them to be relatively short um, just so I can show you the time limits. So we don't wanna be doing minutes or anything like that. So coming down here, um, we do want to use this to create a timer then. You know, something that will keep track of when that time limit expires. And to do this, we're gonna use the time package. So I'm just gonna go timer golang. And you'll see here that when you search this, the time package comes up. There's a go by example article that has timers. So it is one of those things where if you just sort of search for what you think you want, 
you there's a good chance that you'll find it. Now, in this case, I knew that timer was something that was there. Um, if you had searched, say, time limit Golang, it's possible you won't find useful results. You know, these are all about rate limiting, things like that, which isn't really what we want. So sometimes a lot of just finding the right docs and the right pages means, you know, reorgan or rewording your, your search just to see what it gives you and what other options there are. So we're going to go to the index of the time package and we're going to look at this timer type. And then when we're looking at the timer type, uh, basically this is a type that after a certain time has expired, we'll send a message over this channel C. So it completely happens in the background. We don't have to worry about, you know, asking it, hey, has this time expired or anything? All we have to do is listen for a message over this channel. So to create a timer, we're going to be using this duration. Um, and before I do that, I do want to say the time package has something else called a ticker, which is very similar to a timer, except a timer only fires once. So if you have a timer of five seconds, after five seconds, it'll fire a message over this channel. Um, the ticker is the same type thing, except every five seconds it sends a message over a channel. So just keep that in mind that the two are slightly different. And if you need something that's you know, continuously sending messages, you definitely want the ticker, not the timer. Um, to create a new timer, we're going to be needing this new timer function. And it needs us to pass in a duration. So I'm just going to go ahead and click into here. And you'll see that when you go to the duration, you'll see some constants and things like that for it. Uh, what we're going to be doing is using the second constant, which is, you know, it's it's some sort of number stored there that allows us to convert whatever units we have into seconds pretty easily, which we'll see how to do in a second. But the bigger thing here is that time.duration is really just a, an int64 behind the scenes. So we're going to be able to use our integers and things like that with it. So coming back here, um, we want to do something like timer colon equals time.new timer. And then we want to do time limit times time.second. So what this is doing is it's saying if this is 30, we want 30 seconds. So that's why we're multiplying the two. But we do have an issue here that if you know if we try to save this, um, this left hand side is an int, this right hand side is a time dot duration. So it's going to say these aren't the same types. So the easiest way to fix that is to convert this part here into a time dot duration. And then at this point, the only error we're getting is that we're just not using this timer variable. So we could then say, uh, something like this timer.c and that's the channel that's so this line 29 what we're doing is we're waiting for a message from that channel so at this point our code will block until it gets a message from the channel and i'm actually just going to show you how this works running it so that you can see this does actually block and stop the program so coming in here we're going to go build and then we're going to run the quiz and we're going to put limit equals two so we want two seconds so you'll see here that whenever we ran this, it actually stopped for about two seconds before it finally presented a problem. And if we change this to say one, you'll see it's a little bit shorter pause. So what's happening here is when we create the timer, um, it's waiting on this line until it gets a message back from that channel. Well, we don't want our code to wait. Um, we're going to want it to move forward. But before I really talk about that, um, I do want to mention that the reason I put the timer here after we parsed the lines and created our problems is because I don't want our timer to be running while our code is trying to, you know, parse, uh, you know, basically do all the setup work. We don't want the user to be losing a little bit of time, even if it's only a fraction of a second that, you know, that happens during setup with the timer. So we're going to do that as late as possible until we're right ready to start presenting problems. So now that we have our timer and we see how to read from the channel and, you know, verify that we're getting a message from it, what we're going to do next is we're going to go ahead and add this to our for loop. And this is where we're going to add it in a way that, as I said earlier, is not perfect, but it's going to be good enough to sort of just show us how it works first. And then we'll come back and fix it a little bit. To start, we're going to just add a select statement to our for loop. And inside of here, our select statement is going to be pretty basic. It's going to say, if we get a message from the timer channel, then we know that we need to stop this for loop. Otherwise, we're going to keep on presenting problems and, you know, continuing, continu uh, continuing that way. So we're going to do something like select. Um, and then inside of here, it's going to be if we have a message from the timer.c, then we're going to, uh, you know, we need to stop this. So let's just say we're going to print out this message and we're going to return from our program. Now, I'm not using a break here because a break would just break out of the select. It wouldn't break out of the for loop. There are ways to fix that. You could use a, a label, for example, but for now we're just going to use the return. I'll show you how to use the uh, label here in a second. 
Next is the default use case. And the default use case is what we're doing here with all this stuff. So we'll just take that all, copy it, paste it up there. And that I think is it. Um, this should show us what is going on whenever we you know, wait for this timer message. And otherwise we're gonna print out a problem. And it's one of the use cases where I mentioned earlier that it's not perfect, but we're gonna go ahead and just see how it works. So I'm just gonna go ahead and run this and show that to you. So let me go ahead and clear this up. And we're gonna have a time limit of say two seconds just so you can see it in action. If I put in 10 here and now I put in two, my time runs out and it gives me a score of two out of 12. Let me get rid of this new line character. Not that one, this one. So we, we want this to be working basically the way it is, except one of the things that's you know, an issue with our code is whenever this format.scanf happens, it blocks our entire program. And even if our time expires, we'll never hear about the message until this code gets to stop blocking. So whenever we come back to our program, we run it. If we're sitting at this problem five plus five, even if we know we've run out of time, you know, we've been sitting here for five seconds, time has definitely expired. We can type in 10 and hit enter and it still counts that as an answer. We don't want that to happen. So one way to handle this would be at this point to see like, all right, did we get a message from the timer? Are we, you know, are we done? You know, was this answer too late? And we could do that, but it's not going to be perfect, especially because the user still has to type in an answer. And you know, it'd be nice just to tell them your time has expired before they waste their time solving a problem or finishing it, only to be told you ran out of time five seconds ago, bud. And that's not what they want. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this code here and we're gonna move it so that it's not blocking. Well, the easiest way to do that is to take this scanf part and to put it into a go routine that will send us a message when it finally gets an answer back from the user. So we're gonna take this line first and we're gonna print it at the very top of our for loop. So every time our for loop starts, we're gonna print out a problem. And that's okay, even if the timer has expired, it's fine. Because you know we can print out the problem then immediately stop the quiz and say, you know, you ran out of time, sorry. And that's, you know, that's gonna be fine. It's not a terrible situation in that case. But what we want to do next is we want to run a go routine. So we're gonna say go funk, and then inside of this, we're gonna define this go routine that we're gonna run. And it's going to scan for an answer. So we gotta put these left and right parentheses here to say that we're calling this function. And this right here is just an anonymous function. So we're gonna scan for the answer here, and we're gonna put it into the answer string. Well, we wanna get this answer back somehow, and you know we need to know when that answer is coming to us. So the easiest way to do that is to create an answer channel. And we're gonna make this a channel for strings. And then inside of this code, we're gonna turn this anonymous function into a closure, which they're basically the same thing, except a closure uses data that was defined outside of it. So in this case, we're going to say, whenever we get an answer, we're gonna send it to the answer channel. So that's what we're doing here with this uh, this arrow is we're sending this answer into the channel. So the you know the arrow is always pointing towards the way the data is moving. So with this code up here working, um, what's going to happen is instead of a default use case, we're going to have a case of if we get an answer from the answer channel, and in that case we want to check to see if the answer is correct, and if it is correct, we're going to increment that correct amount. But you'll see here in the select statement now, there's no default. It's always waiting to get a message from one channel or the other. So, you know, it's it's not having the default use case where the format.scanf will block. It's instead saying, if I get an answer back before the timer, you know, we get a message from the timer, then it's a valid answer. If we get the, you know, if we get the timer back, then we know that no matter what the answer is, it's not valid. And we can you know, return like we are. So looking at this, um, I think we're ready to try this. So let's just go ahead and build our code and see what happens. And here I can put in 10. You'll see that whenever our time expires, it does actually stop. And if I just sit at the first question, you know, the same type thing happens. Now we might want to go ahead and put something like a new line because our problem doesn't have a new line at the end. So maybe here it makes sense to put a new line at the start so that it's always there. And in this case, uh, we don't need to do it if they complete the entire quiz. And the only reason we don't need to do that is because the user's gonna be pressing enter after every answer. So we know there's gonna be a new line if they, you know, if the time doesn't run out. So I think that's roughly it for, you know, just making this work. Um, I did tell you earlier that I was gonna show you about um, breaking with the loops or with labels. So we could do something like problem loop. And this is a label. So it's just, you know, some text or whatever with a colon at the end. It's sort of like a case, uh, you know, it looks very similar to that. You put it somewhere like this. 
And then down here in your code, you'd put break problem loop. And it'll break to that label. So I personally don't like the look of these that much. They feel a little bit too much like a go loop or sorry, a go to from at times for me. So you won't see me use them very often. But I will say that there are cases where they're very useful and they're handy and you kind of need them. But there's also a lot of cases where people will use them and instead of using them, they could have broken, the, you know, it's a good sign that they could have broken their code into smaller functions that were used that would have made it easier. So, you know, your mileage may vary there. It's whatever you think makes the most sense. But in this case, what we could do is something like print line and then just break the loop. And in this case, we don't have to do this printf twice. So we can do um, go build and you'll see here that the print line, whenever the time expires, prints. And then this you scored zero out of 12 is coming from line 52. Now, if you wanted to add testing to this, um, I'm not going to do an in-depth code review right now, but what I will tell you is that the code we have is not incredibly easy to test. And that's mostly because it's a main, you know, it's in a main function. This isn't broken into smaller functions that we can write unit tests for. So one of the things you might want to focus on if you are starting to refactor your code and getting it ready for testing and that sort of thing is taking this and breaking up some of this into functions that are easier to test. So rather than trying to make your test work for your code, this is a situation where realistically you just need to write code that is easier to test. Um, I'm not going to be doing that now, and I think this code is actually fine for what we're doing because it's only 75 lines of code, and it's meant to be you know an isolated small program like this. So I don't think it's as big of a deal to have something like this. And if you really, really wanted to test, you could even write a functional test that expects the entire quiz game to work correctly, and you know you just test it from that angle. So we're going to leave it as is for the time being, but potentially in the future, I will do a video where we refactor this and turn it into something that is you know, easier to test and easier to maintain.